In a previous video we looked at early castles and in particular, Motton Bailey castles. In this video, we'll look at the later development of castles and the different parts of a stone keep castle. We've been fortunate enough over the past year to see so many different castles and as much more to come as we aim to visit every castle in the UK. So join us today as we look at history's most famous type of castle, the stone keep. Remember to support the channel, please make sure to subscribe. Stonekeep castles are the most familiar image that one thinks of when someone says the word castle. Fine examples of Stonekeep castles in England are Warwick Castle, the Tower of London and many more. In fact, the whole of the UK has a huge amount of Stonekeep castles and Wales has more castles per square mile than any country in the world. Shortly after the Norman conquest of England, Motton Bailey castles sprouted up all around the country. These wooden fortifications could be easily and quickly made with the purpose of instilling intimidation and fear into England's population. William the Conqueror, who had just seized the throne, wasn't a popular man due to the fact he was from Normandy and he needed to impose his rule quickly on the civilians. The first stone built tower was actually built in 1060 during the reign of William I and today is found inside the Tower of London. This keep, known as the White Tower, would stand as a reminder to the people of London of the King's power and might. The reasons for transitioning from timber castles to stone isn't clear, but the process was slow and not consistent. It took many years, even hundreds for certain regions of England to change their castles. It was believed that the main reason for changing was due to the weakness of the wooden materials in a Motton Bailey, but recent archaeological research has shown that some wooden castles were as robust and sophisticated as stone castles. As time went on, stone became a more popular building material for keeps in England, however they required more skilled craftsmen to work on. This meant that stone keep castles would be much more expensive and took a long time to create. For example, the keep at Scarborough Castle took around 10 years to build and a keep's walls would grow at around 12 feet per year. The design of the keep in particular changed over the years too and different rooms inside these would be made. Initially, they were quite basic, however they would become huge bastions of power and also grandeur as kings and queens would show off their wealth as well as their control. We will look at different keep designs in another video, but one of the most prolific castle builders in England was a Plantagenet king, Edward I. Today, many of these castles still stand and many were often sieged. One of the best things about Stonekeep castles though is that today many still remain and can be viewed. Join us now as we show you around the different parts of a Stonekeep castle. The keep or great tower is the most recognisable part of a castle. These remained from the Motton Baileys, however were made of solid stone. The keep's purpose was initially to act as a last bastion should the castle be sieged. They were also the living quarters of a castle's custodian and also a place to keep and store treasure, money and riches. Keeps are extremely diverse and as mentioned earlier, we'll look at these in more detail in a different video. One of the most elaborate keeps we've ever visited was Dover Castles. It was created in the 1180s by Henry II. It's a fantastic example of a medieval keep that still stands. Inside this particular keep, are many different rooms such as a king's chamber where Henry would entertain his courtiers, great banqueting halls, lavish bedrooms, ornate chapels, kitchens and so much more. However if you contrast this with a smaller keep, for example Conisborough Castle, you'll see a very basic tower structure with only bedrooms, a tiny chapel and small living quarters. You would also see privies or toilets in the keep which would usually lead to a moat. What I'm trying to say is that keeps are very varied in their interior and the grandness of these is definitely decided by the strategic importance and wealth of the person building it. Keeps were designed to be the strongest part of a castle and sadly following the English Civil War, many of these were slighted by parliamentarians to ensure that they couldn't be used to start a rebellion later on. One of the most essential features of the Mott and Bailey Castle was the Mott. This was a hill or an artificial mound which was created to place the keep on top of it. Sometimes these mounds were huge and in other times they were quite small. The earth on top of the mott was flattened to build the keep. Motts were a good defensive fortification as they would be slow to run up should someone be attacking them. From the keep, the defenders of the castle could then shoot arrows down onto the mott to take the attackers down easier. The defensive value of the mott was the reason it stayed as the high ground was key for defence. 
The bailey was also another feature that stayed from the previous castle design. The bailey was the heart of the castle. Inside this area, many people would be based and would work. Inside the Motton Bailey Castle, wooden buildings would be built here, but these would later be converted into stone. Many people such as blacksmiths and cooks would work inside the bailey to serve the castle's owner or the king. The bailey is also known sometimes as the ward too, and there would be an inner or an outer bailey sometimes. The inner would be much more secure and often gate posts or houses would secure entry into this area. The baileys would be enclosed by a curtain wall and also by different towers which would overlook this. Inside this area might also be a great hall, a chapel and many other buildings. There would be stores, bakeries and even possibly kitchens inside the bailey. One of the most important parts of a stonekeep castle was in fact the curtain walls. Previously in modern bailey castles, these were known as palisades and were made from wood, but now these were seemingly impenetrable and made from stone. The curtain wall is usually an outer wall, however some of these are found inside the castle protecting the inner bailey, an example of this is at Scarborough Castle. These curtain walls would often vary in size, from 6 to 20 feet thick, possibly almost 50 feet high and can also be kilometres long. Curtain walls were introduced in England in iron and bronze age hill forts and had been around for a long time, but these new stone walls were huge indicators of wealth and especially power. The taller and thicker the curtain walls, the more wealth and power the castle's owner or king had. These walls often had ramparts on them so guards could patrol and also there were often crenellations for defence and arrow slits here so the guards could fire on enemies. These ramparts often were great platforms for fighting to take place on and acted as a good vantage point. Previously these walls could have been destroyed by fire and would have rotted but the new stone technology prevented this. Also they could be sloped which would make it more difficult to conquer or scale. Buttresses would be found on the curtain walls to help support the weight of the walls. These were sloped to take the weight of the different parts of the castle and were introduced during the 13th and 14th century. Stone towers or flanking towers were also defensive structures built into the curtain walls. These were high altitude structures designed to defend different sides of the castle and usually many of these are found within a castle's walls and they are linked together to allow guards to travel easily from one part of the castle to another. Flanking towers were usually made from stone in stonekeep castles but also could be made from mixed materials or wood. They took a number of different shapes depending on the time they were built and these could be circular, semicircular, square or any other shape. There would be different rooms on each floor of these towers and they would often contain arrow loops, machicolations or crenellations to help defend different parts of the castle. Also inside the bailey could be a number of apartments or living quarters. These were sometimes kept separate from the castle's keep in which only the castle's owner or the king would be housed. However sometimes apartments were needed for staff who worked inside the castle and also lower priority guests. These are found sometimes in the bailey's towers and often were in flanking towers as well. Inside these rooms would be different furniture, beds and also fireplaces. The solar isn't found in all castles, however this was sometimes a room or a collection of rooms known as the Lord and Ladies Chambers or the Great Chamber. The solar was intended for use as a bedroom used by the Lord and the Lady of the Castle and it afforded some privacy for the family of the castle. This type of chamber was originally a partitioned room added to the end of the Great Hall for Lords to retire to. Later on, this room would be located on an upper floor. It also could contain a wardrobe and the furniture inside here would include beds, chairs and tables. The word solar derives from the Latin word solaris which meant sun, showing it was meant to be a prestigious and bright room. The castle's gatehouse was usually the main entrance to the castle and was also heavily guarded. It would be defended by at least one portcullis, a heavy grilled door that dropped vertically down to protect the castle's entrance. The gatehouse would contain some murder holes and arrow loops in the side walls. This would be prominent mostly in castles with two portcullises which could be used to trap invaders. Interestingly, sometimes chapels would be built close to the gatehouse. This was done as it was seen that the enemy would be attacking and firing on the chapel and subsequently even attacking God. Gatehouses were often extremely strong and the stone here would possibly be its thickest throughout the whole castle as it was the first line of defence. Some gatehouses also had a drawbridge which could be raised and lowered if danger was nearby. The Barbican usually formed part of the gatehouse 
and it is a forward defensive structure which is set out in front of the gatehouse and is part of the castle's main defences. The Barbican would add strength to the gatehouse and could be used by guards to fire down on or attack an enemy. It was usually accessed for a passageway and also the portcullis could be raised or lowered in the Barbican. Another feature that stood the test of time in some castles is the moat. This was a water filled ditch that surrounded the mot or mound and added extra defence. The moat was aimed to slow an enemy down and often it was found to contain dead animals and also human waste which would put an invader off. When someone draws a castle, chances are that they draw battlements without even knowing they are doing this. They are the most distinguishable feature of a castle and were built to withstand a battle. Built upon the ramparts, they are found on top of the castle. They had regular gaps into fire arrows which were made of crenels and merlons. Crenels are the gaps or open spaces that are usually 2-3 to three feet wide so guards could fire arrows out. They are sometimes known as crenellations as well. The merlons are the solid portions between two crenels, usually 4-5 to five feet wide and 3-7 to seven feet high and were used for guards to hide behind whilst reloading arrows. These were particularly powerful in a stone keep castle and also wooden shutters could be made to draw across the crenels offering even more protection during a siege. Machiculations are also found here. These are overhanging parts of a castle's wall which had holes in the floor. Usually these were used to drop missiles onto an enemy, for example burning hot sand which would get into the armour of an enemy. These are sometimes also known as murder holes. The Great Hall was usually found inside the bailey of the castle. This part of a stone keep was used to entertain guests. It's sometimes separate from the keep, however can also be found inside there. The Great Hall would be the place which was used to house extremely lavish banquets with esteemed guests and also entertainment such as music being heard there. The castle's owners would be sat at the end of the hall with all the guests being able to see them and their hospitality would show off their wealth and power. Also a chapel was found sometimes inside a bailey usually close to the great hall. This was the main religious centre of the castle and could also be found inside a keep. I'm sure you know that the medieval times were mostly centred around religion and this was possibly the most important part of a medieval person's life. Inside these chapels would be a number of different prayer books, shrines and relics. Religious relics were a key indicator of a castle owner's piety, their wealth and religious importance. Usually a priest would be employed to work here. Possibly one of the greatest chapels I've seen has to be the circular chapel inside Ludlow Castle which shows off some remarkable medieval architecture. Dungeons are possibly the most notorious part of a castle. These were usually housed in the ground in Stonekeep castles and the new building materials allowed these to be much more secure. The dungeons were usually small and dark rooms which were aimed to house prisoners. Usually punishment and torture would occur inside these dungeons and also these were horrific places for someone to end up. Prisoners could often find themselves chained to the walls which would be brutal and sometimes be fed very little if not anything at all. One type of dungeon is known as an oubliette. This was basically just a small hole in the ground in which prisoners would just be left inside and forgotten about. Usually inside an oubliette, sewage would be thrown inside here and there would even be rats which would eat a person's corpse after death. You really didn't want to end up in the oubliette. The magazine is a more modern feature of a stonekeep castle. Following developments in weapon technology and the use of guns and ammunition, magazines were adapted inside castles and forts. These were highly risky places to work in in which gunpowder was stored and also where charges and explosives were made. Inside these small rooms, even a small spark could ignite a huge explosion and even blow the whole castle up. One of the most forgotten parts but most vital parts of a stonekeep castle has to be the well. These were huge holes dug deep into the ground in order to source water for the castle's owner and its inhabitants. During a siege which could go on for months, this would possibly be the most important part of the castle as the defenders would have water to drink and wash. Stonekeep castles had a number of advantages. It was much stronger than previous wooden castles and also contained many more features and were much more advanced. As some of these were huge, they could be garrisoned by a huge number of soldiers making sure they were well protected. Also they still maintained high ground as they were built higher up so it could offer great sight lines and would dominate the landscape. The thick walls would offer great protection and also seemed impenetrable 
and would last much longer than Motton Bailey castles. In fact, some of these have stood for 900 or so years. The strong building materials also allowed them to be built extremely high, intimidating anyone who lived nearby. There were also a few disadvantages though. For example, they were slow to build and were extremely costly. Unlike the previous Motton Baileys, they were not cheap and easy to resource, as stone could cost a lot to transport and also quarry. So Stonekeep castles have stood the test of time, and have been around in England for almost a millennium. Hopefully you've enjoyed this detailed look at Stonekeep castles. If you have, please subscribe to the channel. Once again, thank you for watching.